Okay. So, uh, thank you everybody for joining me here today on my talk on a comprehensive formal security analysis of OAuth 2.0. So, um, this is joint work with Ralph Kusters and Guido Schmitz. And um, what is this all about? Well, I guess everybody of you has seen one of these websites where you can sign in uh, not only using your username and password, but also sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google. If you click on one of these buttons, for example, on sign in with Facebook, then you get a new window where you enter your credentials for Facebook, and then afterwards, you're automatically also signed into TripAdvisor in this example. So this is single sign-on in the web, and uh, the technology that um, this is most often based on is called OAuth, OAuth 2.0 in particular. So what did we do? So we took OAuth and we created a formal model of the OAuth standard, which itself is based on a generic model of the web. And uh, this generic model of the web is in fact the most comprehensive model of the web infrastructure to date. And we presented this on Security and Privacy 2014. And again, this generic model is what our model of OAuth is based on. We then went on to formalize central security aspects, uh, properties of OAuth, namely authorization, authentication, and session integrity, and then tried to prove these properties. However, at first we failed to prove these properties because in fact we found severe attacks on OAuth, uh, which interestingly also translate into attacks on OpenID Connect, which is a single sign-on standard that is based on OAuth. We then proposed fixes against these attacks. Um, these mitigations are actually currently under discussion to be included in a new RFC. And then we proved the security for the fixed OAuth standard. So if you're interested in all the details on our work, please have a look at our technical report and the paper, both of which are available on our homepage. Okay, so let's start with having a look at the generic model that our work is based on. So first of all, why do we need formal treatment for web security at all? So as you all know, there have been many flaws and attacks uh, discovered over the last years in web applications and in, in the web infrastructure itself. And one reason for that is that the web is, uh, or web applications become increasingly complex. Um, also, the web itself is just complex because there's always a complex interaction of different components that talk to each other like DNS servers, web servers, web browsers, and so on. Um, so formal methods can really help us to precisely think about web security, um, about the security of web applications, and of course, we also need formal models to precisely specify the security properties that we expect the web application or web mechanism to have, and finally, to carry out security proofs. Another aspect is that the web itself is not defined in just one single document. Instead, the uh, web is spread out over many, many documents, like the HTTP 1 and 2 standards, and HTML 5, and so on, and so on. Um, also, it's sometimes helpful to look at the browser implementations. Um, so a formal model not only provides us the means to uh, carry out security proofs and to, to, um, yeah, to, to formalize stuff, but it can also provide us with a coherent view on core aspects of the web. Okay, so what does our look, model look like? Um, so our model is a Dolev Yao style model that we adapted to the specific needs in the web. Um, we have a network, and using this network, different components can talk to each other. Um, we have web browsers, we have web servers, we have DNS servers, and also some attackers. So we have two types of attackers, namely the web attacker. The web attacker can send and receive messages just like any other process can. And then we also have the network attacker. The network attacker controls the whole network, and it can also, for example, intercept messages that are not intended for him, or it can uh, spoof sender messages, something the web attacker cannot do. Okay, so these are the components in our web model. And now, um, the most interesting and most complex component of these is the web browser. 
So let's have a look at our, what our web browser model look like, looks like. Um, it's quite complex and includes many details. For example, it includes DNS, HTTP, and HTTPS messages. It also contains a complex window and document structure. Inside these uh, documents, there are scripts. Scripts can be honest or can be dishonest, then they are called the attacker scripts. Um, we model technologies, modern technologies such as web storage, but also legacy technologies such as cookies. Um, we have web messaging, so sending post messages uh, between windows. And we also have XML HTTP requests, so AJAX. Um, and we have many more details, such as message headers, uh, HTTP redirections, security policies and navigation policies, uh, dynamic corruption, and so on and so on. So as you can see, the model uh, is quite complex and comprehensive, um, but still, of course, it's a model. So uh, clearly, there are some things we cannot model. Um, for example, we cannot talk about language details. So for example, JavaScript, um, the syntax of JavaScript is out of the scope of our model, but we can capture the input and output behavior of JavaScript. So we can talk about what JavaScript can do. Um, we do not model user interface details. So for example, iframes overlapping each other. Um, or, so for, for click jacking attacks, for example, that's something we do not model. Um, and clearly, byte level attacks um, is something we cannot model. So for example, buffer overflows. Um, but again, we can capture the effects of buffer overflows because we have this dynamic corruption. And as is typical for, for a dolev style model, uh, we also have an abstract view on cryptography. So for example, we assume that TLS just works. We used this generic model in previous case studies. Um, first, to analyze the security and privacy of Mozilla Browser ID, a single sign-on system with a very specific goal regarding privacy. Um, we found many interesting attacks on this uh, single sign-on system. Uh, we were able to finally prove the security for um, Mozilla's browser ID. However, uh, we also noted that privacy is essentially broken beyond repair. Therefore, we went on and designed a new single sign-on system called Espresso to demonstrate this is, that this kind of privacy is achievable in the web. And um, this was uh, our last case study before OAuth uh, that we used this model for. Okay, so as I already said, our model of OAuth is based on this generic model. And before we come to the model of OAuth, let's have a look at OAuth itself. OAuth is a standard for web authorization and single sign-on defined by the IETF in RFC 6749 and is the most predominant web single sign-on system in the web. So it's used almost everywhere. It's the basis for sign-in with Facebook, for example. Um, and it's also the foundation for OpenID Connect uh, which, again, is used in, for example, sign-in with Google. So OAuth is almost everywhere. And um, OAuth knows many different options and uh, modes. For example, there are things called client secrets, and they can be there or they can be absent. Um, there are redirect URIs, which can be limited um, there by using URI patterns and so on. And most importantly, there are four different modes of interaction or flows or grants uh, in OAuth. Uh, so let's have a look at these. They're called the implicit mode, the authorization code mode, the resource owner password credentials mode, and the client credentials mode. Of these, the first two are the most commonly used in the web. And um, here we'll have a look at the implicit mode, and we'll show all the attacks using the implicit mode. However, however the other modes are also covered in our paper. So let's have a look at the implicit mode. So how does it work? Um, how does a typical flow of OAuth look like? So here we have three parties, namely the browser on the left, the relying party in the middle, and Facebook as the identity provider on the right. So first of all, the browser tells the relying party, hey, I'd like to log in using Facebook, for example. Then the relying party redirects the user to Facebook, where the user then authenticates herself using her username and password usually, and after checking these credentials, Facebook redirects the user back to the relying party. 
Now Facebook has then created an access token. And this access token um, is appended to the redirection URI in the last part of the URI behind this fragment sign. Um, and this uh, part of the URI is not transferred to, um, to the relying party by the browser. This is the behavior of browsers. Um, so in step four here, a document is retrieved from the relying party. The relying party so far doesn't know the access token. But in the next step, the document, the JavaScript in the document, can send the access token to the relying party. So this means that the relying party now knows this access token and can use this access token. For example, it can uh, use it at Facebook to retrieve some uh, data um, or to, to act on behalf of the user, or it can be used to retrieve a user identifier at Facebook and then consider the user to be locked in in the last step, so the user then locked in to the relying party. So this is the implicit mode of OAuth, and again, we will show all the, detail, uh, all the attacks using uh, this mode, this flow. The uh, OAuth can also be used with multiple identity providers. Um, so then it looks like this. So there's a relying party that allows its user, for example, to sign in using Facebook or GitHub. And in this case, in the first step, the user selects the identity provider it wants to use to sign in. And after the fourth step, the relying party has to remember which identity provider the user choose in the first place to sign in. How does it do that? Well, pretty simple and obvious. It can store this data in a session. This uh, session, um, the session ID is then put into a cookie, and this cookie is sent in the browser. So now in step four, the relying party can easily look up this data and see that the user, in this example, you wanted to sign in using Facebook. This is what is called the explicit user uh, intention tracking. Um, there's also an alternative um, that we talk about in the paper, the naive user intention tracking, which shouldn't be used. Um, but yeah, for this talk, let's focus on the explicit user intention tracking. Okay, so this was the implicit mode of OAuth. And um, for the other modes, again, see our paper. They are all covered there. And um, as you can see, OAuth is rather complex. But so far, there was no security proof for OAuth. And this is what we were interested in. And therefore, we developed the formal model of OAuth. We then went on to formalize the security properties of OAuth. And these I will present in the following. Um, first, let's start with a kind of obvious property here, the authorization property. The authorization property says that an attacker should be unable to get hold of an access token, which would allow the attacker to act on the user's behalf, for example, at Facebook. So uh, what we see in the last step here should not be possible. Then we also have the authentication property, which is a bit different. It says that the attacker should be unable to log in at the relying party under an honest user's identity. Um, so again, what we see here in the last step seven, that the attacker is locked in as an honest user, should not be possible. Then we have a third property, which is a bit less obvious. And this is the session integrity property. Session integrity says that if a relying party acts on the user's behalf at Facebook, for example, then the user explicitly expressed her consent to actually sign in at this relying party using Facebook. So uh, this captures uh, things such, uh, or attacks that can result um, from cross site request forgery or session swapping. So this is the third and last of our properties. And as I already said, we then tried to prove these properties, uh, but found some severe attacks on OAuth and also OpenID Connect. And these attacks are the following. We have the 307 redirect attack, we have the IDP mix-up attack, both of which target authorization and authentication. And we have the state leak attack and the naive RP session integrity attack, both of which target session integrity. So let's have a look at the 307 redirect attack. So we've seen this flow before. This is the implicit flow. Um, and here, let's have a closer look at what happens uh, in step two, three, and four. So let's zoom in there. 
And um, if we split this up, we can see the following, what usually happens there. Um, first, the browser is being redirected to Facebook. So then Facebook sends a web form to the browser where the user then can enter her credentials. So the user will do that. And then username and password are being sent to Facebook. Now, Facebook will create this access token, as we've seen before, and redirect the user back to the relying party. Now, what can happen is the following. If Facebook would use, they don't do it, but if they would use the HTTP status code 307 for the redirection, then this would instruct the browser to send username and password again, because it's post data, and this would result in the relying party receiving the username and password of the user, which are intended only for Facebook, of course. So if the, attack, if the relying party is malicious, um, then it would receive username and password. So this kind of attack seems a bit maybe obvious at first, but actually it is explicitly allowed by the OAuth standard to use any redirection method that is available. And um, clearly this, uh, at least the 307 redirection code should uh, not be allowed. And the mitigation here is simple. It's to make any other redirection method that doesn't forward this post data to the relying party mandatory. So this is the first attack. And now let's have a look at the more complex IDP mix-up attack. So um, first of all, here again is our implicit flow as we've seen it before. Um, first, let's talk about which of these requests are encrypted so using HTTPS and which are not, which we didn't talk about so far. The first request is usually not encrypted. Why is that? Well, the relying parties don't, usually don't see the need to have encryption on this first request since there's no confidential data of any kind in this first request. It's just the user's choice, hey, I'd like to sign in using Facebook. And the other requests are usually encrypted because there's a lot of confidential data there. There's username, passwords, and tokens, and so on. Um, so in the variant of the tag that I present here, we assume that the first request is not encrypted. However, um, there's also a variant of this attack which also works if, even if this first request is encrypted using HTTPS. So let's look at this first request, which is not encrypted. So let's split this up again. Um, so first, the browser sends a message to the re relying party saying, hey, I'd like to log in using Facebook. Now, if there's a network attacker, then this network attacker can play man in the middle and can replace in this message Facebook by attacker. So the relying party will then think that the user wants to sign in using attacker as an identity provider. What then happens is um, the relying party will redirect the user to the attacker. Now the attacker can again change this response and can override attacker with Facebook. So the user will, be, will actually be redirected to Facebook. So that means that the rest of the protocol works as we have seen before because the user authenticates at Facebook. And then after step five, the relying party receives an access token. Now, the relying party still thinks that the user actually signed in using the attacker as an IDP. Therefore, the relying party will take the access token and send it to the attacker. So the attacker will get hold of an access token that is valid for an honest user at Facebook. And this clearly breaks the authorization property. Now, um, this attack seems pretty simple if you look at it like we did here, but in practice, you have to take care of many more details. For example, if you want to break authentication instead of authorization, you have to do some additional steps of the protocol. Um, you also have to take care of things such as client identifiers, uh, client credentials, and if you want to attack not OAuth but OpenID Connect, you have to take care of even more things such as message signing, uh, the ID token, uh, dynamic endpoint discovery, and so on. But we were able to show that this attack that we discovered in our formal model can successfully be applied to real-world implementations. Okay, so what can we do against this attack? Um, so this is the attack. And what we've seen here is that the problem is that the relying party thinks that the user will now authenticate to Facebook 
while the user actually signed uh, to the attacker, while the user actually authenticated to Facebook. So there's a mismatch there. And we need to provide a means for the relying party to discover this mismatch. And this could be done as follows. As, uh, we could attach the identity of the identity provider to uh, the redirection URI in step three. So after step five, the relying party will know at which identity provider the user signed in. And if the, uh, if the uh, user authenticated to Facebook, but the relying party thinks that the user would uh, sign in to the attacker, then the relying party can stop the whole process as soon as it detects this mismatch. So this is a mitigation that we proposed, and um, this is actually uh, under discussion to be included into an RFC um, to mitigate this attack. Okay, so these were the first two attacks that we discovered. For the other attacks, um, please have a look at the uh, paper. Um, they're described in detail there. So now, um, as I already said, or, or yeah, said, is uh, we talked to the ITF OAuth working group about this, and they scrambled for an emergency meeting uh, where they invited us to present our findings. Um, they coordinated the uh, public disclosure of the attacks, and all, um, our findings also triggered uh, the creation of an OAuth security workshop, which happened, uh, which, which took place for the first time in this year. And a new RFC mitigating the attacks is currently under preparation. And um, our um, attacks and our methodology also sparked the interest in formal analysis at the OAuth working group. They also very much appre appreciated the proof that we performed, which I will talk about next. So, for our proof, to pr finally prove the security of OAuth, we made the following assumptions. First of all, we assume that you follow the OAuth2 standard closely. So, in other words, there are no stupid implementation bugs. Second, we also want to follow all the security recommendations that were developed for OAuth over the last years and the common web best practices. So, for example, regarding uh, cross-site request forgery protection, uh, the usage of HTTPS, uh, proper session handling, and so on. Then, we assume that we have an unbounded number of relying parties and IDPs and browsers in our model, which, uh, all of which can also become corrupted. Also, we assume that all the modes and all the options of OAuth are used concurrently at the same time. And for authorization and authentication, we assume the presence of a network attacker. While for session integrity, we have, the, um, we have to assume the presence only of a web attacker or multiple web attackers. Why is that? Well, for session integrity, um, session integrity in OAuth is often based on this integrity of cookies. And as you might know, cookies don't have any. Um, that's, so for example, if you have any unencrypted request between a browser and a relying party, any unencrypted request, then a network attacker can easily put a new cookie into the HTTP re response, which then afterwards will even be used or can even overwrite encrypted, uh, so cookies for encrypted connections. So uh, this means that session integrity is immediately broken if you rely on cookies, which almost all the OAuth implementations do, and um, yeah, if you have a network attacker. Therefore, we assume the presence of a web attacker. We then carried out the proof uh, before, uh, before, of course, we stated the theorem, that, namely that OAuth satisfies authorization, authentication, and session integrity properties, and we were able to show that this uh, theorem holds true. Now, as a last step, let's have a brief look at related work. Um, because it's interesting to note that so far, almost all the analysis work um, was targeted at finding bugs in specific implementations of OAuth, but there was almost no analysis on the OAuth standard itself. One notable exceptions, except, exception is a formal analysis uh, performed by Karthik Bhagavan and his team, uh, which, however, is based on a much less detailed model of the web and uh, also doesn't include all the options and modes of OAuth. And most importantly, so far, there was no security proof for OAuth. So 
uh, this concludes my talk, and I think we have time for some questions. Thank you very much.